This is Laurie Moore Moore with Texas Brave and Strong. Tidbits of Texas history you never learned in school. Today's episode, Dancing with the Enemy in San Antonio. In the first years of the Civil War, San Antonio homes opened their doors to a group of Union officers. Yeah, Union officers, extending invitations to dinners and dances. The city paid for their hotel rooms and provided other benefits. This while battles raged elsewhere in the country. Here's how it happened. In the early 1860s, as the Civil War appeared imminent, San Antonio was the largest and possibly the most cosmopolitan town in Texas. A cacophony of languages echoed through the streets and plazas. The language heard most often in the small city was German. In fact, the number of German and other European residents dominated the city. Americans and Mexicans were significantly outnumbered. As a result, San Antonio citizens had opinions that may have differed from those in many other Texas towns, as actions during the Civil War reveal. The election of Abraham Lincoln to the U.S. presidency in 1861 created quite a stir in San Antonio. Citizens called for a mass meeting to discuss what Lincoln's election might mean for Texas and for the institution of slavery. One citizen, Samuel Maverick, a local cattleman and former mayor of the city, argued that the time for resistance had come. Since states' rights were no longer secure, Texas must secede, he told the crowd gathered in Alamo Plaza in front of the Minker Hotel. Rancher Charles Anderson, a recent arrival from Ohio, took the other side of the debate with a passionate speech in defense of remaining part of the United States. When the February of 1861 vote on the Ordinance of Secession rolled around, San Antonio citizens voted against leaving the Union. However, the overall vote in Texas was for secession, so the state seceded, then moved forward to join the Confederacy. This presented special challenges for Texas. Nineteen United States federal forts stretched from the Red River to the southern tip of Texas. 25% of the U.S. War Office's budget was spent in Texas, and at least 6% of the troops in the U.S. Army were stationed in these forts. These soldiers were charged with the task of protecting the frontier settlements west of the Brazos River from marauding Comanche and Apache. Almost immediately after the vote to secede, members of the Texas Secession Convention began negotiations to take over the forts and the more than a million dollars worth of weapons and supplies held in those forts. On the other side of the negotiation table was Major General David Twiggs, the 70-year-old commander of all the Texas forts. During the discussions, a force of over 1,000 Texans under the command of Ben McCullough had gathered and surrounded the San Antonio Federal Buildings in a dramatic show of force. Twiggs restrained his small group of about 160 local soldiers to avoid bloodshed. In the continuing negotiations, Twiggs was willing to give up the forts and supplies, but only in return for allowing all U.S. troops to leave honorably with their weapons. Texas officials resisted allowing the soldiers to leave until they discovered that Twiggs' replacement, Colonel Carlos Waite, was on his way to San Antonio to take command. Believing Colonel Waite would be less likely to yield to Texas's demands, it was finally agreed that federal troops would be allowed to leave with their arms. The terms of surrender were signed on February 18, 1861. Colonel Wade arrived the following day and was taken prisoner. Major General Twiggs had avoided what could have been a bloody flashpoint starting the Civil War. Instead, the Civil War began later that same year on the 12th of April, when shots were fired on Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. With the agreement to turn over the federal forts signed, 
U.S. Army officers began the process of abandoning Texas forts and moving their troops to the Gulf Coast for evacuation. In April, a group of about 350 officers and enlisted men traveling toward the coast under the command of Colonel Isaac Reeve arrived in San Antonio after a brief confrontation with more than a 1,000 Confederate volunteers. Again, no blood was shed, but the confrontation ended up with the Federal group being identified as prisoners of war to be held until prisoner exchanges could be arranged. The question was, what to do with them? There were as yet no Confederate rules regarding the handling of prisoners, so San Antonio was free to develop its own policies. Now remember, these were the very men who had been protecting the Texas frontier from the Indians. Many people also believed that the war would be short and Federal troop protection would be returned. A temporary camp for the enlisted men was established at San Antonio's San Pedro Springs Park. The camp was later moved about seven miles away to Salado Creek. Security was lax. The soldiers were free to go within a mile of the camp without a permit or go into town after simply requesting a permit. The Confederate officer overseeing the camp was said to have commented that he had not one particle of trouble from any of them. Trained soldiers were in short supply by both sides in the war, so there was hope that by such generous treatment, the Union soldiers might come across to the Confederate side. To encourage this, a soldier crossing over would enter the Confederate service at a higher rank. Very few of the troops switched allegiance. The city extended full hospitality to the 11 Union officers. In a time when military officers held high social status and were considered to be gentlemen, they were treated as such. The officers were housed at the city's expense in hotels and guest houses. Food and clothing were provided, and at one point the city even considered paying them a monthly stipend. What's more, San Antonio citizens opened their doors to the officers. Parties, dinners, and balls filled the social calendar night after night, and the Union officers were invited guests. Officers were allowed to keep their weapons and were free to wander the town, visit friends, enjoy fandangos, buy chili in the plazas from the famous Chili Queens, even leave town on quail hunts. It was understood that they would always act as gentlemen toward their hosts. However, over time, as the horrors of the war became more evident, the social invitations dwindled. All in all, it was a unique situation for both enlisted and officer captives. These prisoners of war were finally part of a prisoner exchange in 1863, after nearly two years of captivity. San Antonio's time of socializing and dancing with the enemy ended. This has been Laurie Moore Moore with the Texas Brave and Strong podcast, posted twice a month, now also available on YouTube. Be sure to check out my historical novel, Gone to Dallas, The Storekeeper, 1856 to 1861. Find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other bookish sites in paperback and as an e-book. Thanks for listening to Texas Brave and Strong. Y'all come back.